The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by CPS America, the maker of North America's number one three-phase string inverter, with over six gigawatts shipped in the U.S. The CPS America product lineup includes three-phase string inverters ranging from 25 to 275 kW. Their flagship inverter, the CPS 250-275, is designed to work with solar plants ranging from 2 megawatts to 2 gigawatts. The 250-275 pairs well with CPS America's exceptional data communication, controls, and energy storage solutions. Go to chinpowersystems.com to find out more. Approaching it as a partnership and not just a buy right project development cycle goes a long way to help the towns feel empowered, honestly, and that they're still in control. And so that's why compliance is so important, because that means that they feel comfortable with us doing something new. They feel comfortable that we're going to adhere to our vegetation management plan, which is not just mowing, it's farming. And that framing has really helped with municipalities as well. They're like, oh, I see. You're actually going to actively manage the land instead of just letting the grass grow four feet tall under the panels. Are you speeding the energy transition? Here at the Clean Power Hour, our hosts Tim Montague and John Weaver bring you the best in solar, batteries, and clean technologies every week. Want to go deeper into decarbonization? We do too. We're here to help you understand and command the commercial, residential, and utility solar, wind, and storage industries. So let's get to it. Together we can speed the energy transition. We're here at the Solar Farm Summit. And my guest today is Lucy Bullock Seeger. She is the vice president of strategy for Lightstar, a community solar developer based in Boston. I'm Tim Montague. Welcome to the Clean Power Hour. Check out all of our content at cleanpowerhour.com. Please give us a rating and a review on Apple and Spotify. And reach out to me on LinkedIn. I love hearing from my listeners. Lucy, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Tim. Excited to learn more about Lightstar. And, but for our listeners, tell us a little more about yourself. How did you get into clean energy? Yeah, so I've been working in clean energy for almost eight years now. I fell into it. I think a lot of people had fell into it. I was, first I came out of school, I wanted to do research because I wanted to inform policy. But then it turns out that I, it, research is too slow. So I jumped onto the policy bandwagon much quicker. And at that time, though, I was doing environmental health research in, in order to inform public health. And so we were doing low-income research studies in low-income housing authorities. And what we were finding was there was higher incidences of, of asthma and other, like, lung-related issues. And it all came down to the fact that they were all cited near fossil fuel-emitting plants. So I thought that was really interesting. And... As I'm wont to do, I like to drill down to the key issue, and it kept pointing me towards clean energy. I did the same thing. I, I was recruited to do fundraising and communications for a national, an international nonprofit that worked with refugees and migrants. And that root cause, a lot of the times, nine times out of ten, is climate change, whether that's famine, people are trying to find more better jobs. So I went back to grad school got my public, uh, master's in public administration and really dove in on land use and clean energy issues and haven't looked back since. And again, I really like to drill in, down on like the greater issues. And when I joined the solar industry, we had a lot of problems with communication. We didn't know how to talk about what we wanted to do, how we wanted to do it and what the benefits were. We were riding this era of good feeling <laughs> and the first 10 years of solar and but then once people started to see solar and see that it got taken out of production, farmland out of production, that's when this, the problems really started. So really, I hopped into the industry right when the land use challenges were really strong. So we went all in on agrivoltaic. I started out with at Blue Wave Solar and then got recruited away to Lightstar and have been there for three and a half years. And really, we are a soup to nuts agrivoltaic firm. We have 1,200 megawatts of solar in the pipeline across 12 states across the country and 300 megawatts of that are in development as agrivoltaic projects there's more in our pipeline that has agrivoltaic potential but we're waiting for the markets to open up for community solar but in the meantime we're working with the co-ops we're working in with utility scale and we're really excited about what agrivoltaics has been able to do for us as a company yeah 
This is one of the things that I really love about agrivoltaics is from a stakeholder relations, from a rural communities relations yeah. perspective, it helps rural communities realize that it can be dual use or multi-purpose, right. right? It's not just taking ag out of production. You can grow sheep, you can grow crops underneath the solar panels. And that is very important, right? Because right. as you mentioned, it is getting harder for energy developers, right. clean energy developers to get their projects permitted. There is more NIMBYism than there was 10 years ago. Right. So I love to hear it when developers say they're all in on agrivoltaics. I think that is vital. And I think that you're going to see more and more developers differentiating themselves in the eye of the public, first and foremost, right. really. I think that's right, because LightStar, if I can jump in for a second, yeah, because please. truly that's what we've seen with what LightStar has done. We really started to seed a couple ideas about, they say agrivoltaics work. The research says that agrivoltaics really helps the community engagement aspect of it. Let's see it for ourselves. And we did do that. We started in New York. And once that worked, we opened up a town that would, had previous solar moratoria, multiple, and then they banned prime soils for solar. And we approached them with the idea about agrivoltaics. And we, it took a long time because, like I said, communication is really key with this. And it opened doors for us. That town had interconnection. Now we have two projects going through permitting. One is already permitted and one's with the town right now. We did that, took it to Maryland. And we're really opening, and it's really exciting to be here to see how it's expanded over even just over the last three years, because it really can bring the community back to solar. And it can also really bring the community back to farmers, because a lot of the times people are wanting to help farmers, and they think that they help farmers by buying their products, which is true, but yeah. we need more farm viability tools. And that's why we're really obsessed with working with American Farmland Trust our agricultural partners, because I always say, I'm not a, I'm not an agricultural person, I'm a solar lady, but we have a great deep respect for our agricultural partners and our landowners and our farmers now on our projects, because this is their livelihood. It's very emotional. It's emotional from all parts, all stakeholders. So it's really exciting to see the industry expand. So I asked this of, of the American Farmland Trust, do we have concrete evidence that Agrivoltaics helps developers get projects permitted with less resistance. What did they say? <laughs> they said, we think so. Yes, they good, because it does. It, it's borne out in their survey they just released, and it, it certainly has been our experience. I joke all the time with our team internally that it's really bad for my hubris because we've been relatively rarely told no. <laughs> and when we approach a, with a thoughtful and concrete and just really thorough agrivoltaics plan. The town, it's a trust issue, right? So we talk about compliance a lot as well with them. That's probably the first question we address with the municipalities is compliance. And we, it's all about- What are the of compliance? So I'm talking about like a, a site plan approval. For example, we approach a town, let's say the one in New York, and we said, we really want to do solar here, and guess what? We're going to do farming in and around it. And they're like, yeah, so how do we build that trust? It's through a compliance mechanism. They need to feel like there's a hammer that if we mess up, then they have some recourse in order to, to rectify it or that we're not just pulling the wool over their eyes, no pun intended, to get agricultural or get solar in the ground and just run. Because we understand and, and realize that the solar industry doesn't have the greatest, oh my gosh, the word is, Track record, track legacy. record, or in reputation, and we're not necessarily. There's not a lot of cut. When you say that, I'm just curious. Yeah. What is the not so great track record that the solar industry has created for itself? Yeah. So I'll use solar moratoria as the example. The reason why a lot of towns and counties use moratoria is because they feel like the developers come in and ex exploit their zoning bylaws to just ram solar projects in into the ground mm -hmm. and so they don't feel to date the reputation has been that solar partners are adversaries of municipalities and counties and permitting authorities rather than partners and so we really want to shift that paradigm because that's how they are often overwhelmed right so we have we talk about this a lot as well you go to a really rural town they have maybe one planner 
they don't have engineers. They may get some support from the state, but a lot of the times they're really overwhelmed and can't understand exactly what they're deciding for their town. And it can be really controversial. Like I said, land is emotional. Towns are emotional. Big decisions at the town level are emotional for people. Approaching it as a partnership and not just a by right project development cycle goes a long way to help the, the towns feel empowered, honestly, and that they're still in control. And so that's why compliance is so important because that means that they feel comfortable with us doing something new. They feel comfortable that we're going to adhere to our vegetation management plan, which is not just mowing, it's farming. And that framing has really helped with municipalities as well. They're like, oh, I see. You're actually going to actively manage the land instead of just letting the grass grow four feet tall under the panels. So that's the compliance we're talking about. I also offer farmland tax assessment if we can get it with local county assessors, because if we can, compliance mechanism that the municipalities can feel really comfortable with, that it's not just them that they're signing off on permit approval for this. It, they've got, we've got somebody else to answer to, to make sure that we're in production as much as possible. You said you've been at LightStar for three years? Yeah. Okay. And in that time, how has LightStar changed and how has the industry changed, do you think, regarding agrivoltaic? Yeah. LightStar, when I first came to LightStar, I basically was recruited to come and implement a new market strategy and a responsible siting strategy. Basically, finding more megawatts and more land where there essentially wasn't. And agrivoltaics was the answer to that. And my simple formula for changing an organizational structure to, to adopt agrivoltaics is for the policy people and the engineers to get in a room and work it out. <laughs> because if the pie in the sky policy people aren't talking to the engineers about agrivoltaics, never going to take off internally. And I'm also like an organizational management nerd. And it's a simple case study on making sure that the silos are broken down, that we're having a long-term conversation about how we're actually going to do this. And leadership is really important in that. Because if middle management is talking about this direction, but they're not getting the go-ahead from the top, it's just going to fail. But I've seen this happen in the industry over the last three years, is that people are actually talking about it. I were talking to more engineers at this conference than I've experienced. It's not just the pie in the sky policy solution people. And it's really good to start hearing the case studies about things that are actually in the ground, how we're designing around challenges, how we're working with farmers in the long term. It, the adoption of it has actually been interesting. I thought that the DG developers, the distributed generation developers, were going to adopt. And then the utility scale people will just take it and run and scale. It's actually been the opposite. It's been slower in the last three years for DG because I think of cost issues. But the utility scale developers are really in an emergent place <laughs> and they are facing losing their permits because of land use challenges, but they don't, they can't give up their interconnection queue position that they've had for sometimes 10 years. And their investors are telling them to do whatever it takes. And sometimes that means scrapping the entire design and going back to basics with agrivoltaics because that's the only path forward. It's been really surprising to me, but it, it makes a lot of sense because we're at this pinnacle point um, of the curve of adoption. So, The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by CPS America, the maker of North America's number one three-phase string inverter, with over six gigawatts shipped in the U.S. The CPS America product lineup includes three-phase string inverters ranging from 25 to 275 kW. Their flagship inverter, the CPS 250-275, is designed to work with solar plants ranging from 2 megawatts to 2 gigawatts. The 250-275 pairs well with CPS America's exceptional data communication, controls, and energy storage solutions. Go to chintpowersystems.com to find out more. So you came from Blue Wave, which is an even earlier adopter of agrivoltaics. Yep. yep. An uh, incubator. Yep. Do, you, do you know how is it that Blue Wave glommed on to agrivoltaics so early? Yeah. I was there. <laughs> that was one of the first things for the SMART program, that the rules that came out. And it was actually, oh man, this is a deep dive. This is Massachusetts. This is Massachusetts. Yeah. This is a deep cut for all the policy nerds out there that have been around since then. If you go and you look on the historical documents of the Massachusetts SMART program, 
There is the very first PowerPoint presentation that they ever did about the preferred citing mechanisms they wanted to see in the SMART program iteration. Agrivoltaics is not a part of that. And Blue Wave at that time, when I had just first joined, made a big push in efforts for agrivoltaics to be included in that. So huge shout out to John DeVillers, who is the chairman emeritus of Blue Wave, really pushed hard for agrivoltaics to have an incentive in the SMART program. Because the last, the first two SREC programs, they were perceived to have been forest clearing and all of that kind of stuff. And there was a huge backlash for the land use situation in Massachusetts at that time, despite being the first state in the nation to basically solarize all their landfills. If you look in the next PowerPoint, there is agrivoltaics. So that's the genesis of Blue Wave's influence on agrivoltaics at the very beginning of the SMART program. And so they have been stewards of that portion of the program forever. And they've done a really good job. And it's been difficult because it, it was a new thing. I think what the, the biggest problem is that a lot of folks understand that it's rate payer money on the table with the incentive. Six cent a kilowatt hour incentive is pretty good. Yeah. And so there's a lot of pressure internally within the agencies about project approval because that's a lot. And they want to see true agricultural production. But what's been happening is a bottleneck. There's been some changes in the program, and that's very good. And we at Lights are like to see that. And we keep working with folks in Massachusetts to get them more comfortable. But now that the first generation of projects are in the ground, we can do so much more with that. But interconnection is also a problem for agrivoltaics in Massachusetts. But that's a whole other podcast. Now, tell me more about the community solar rules in Massachusetts. How does agrivoltaics factor in? Is it, a, is it an absolute must now? No, it's not. It's an ad. So... You're getting an adder if you do... Agri yes, you get an adder agri if you have agrivoltaics, agri but you have to do it within the, the layers, the GIS layers that they have. So there's a ban on a few of the GIS layers in Massachusetts of all solar. And then there's a, a semi-ban on what's called the critical natural landscape layer, which is a significant amount of Massachusetts land. Uh, and you must do agrivoltaics if you were to site on that land. So that's essentially why the community solar market in Massachusetts has grind to a halt, ground to a halt, because it really narrowed. I think when I, we did this analysis and we provided it for comments just earlier this year, I think there's 121 parcels in the entire state of Massachusetts that qualify. And so you gotta find a farmer to do it, that wants to do it, that has interconnection and is willing to sign a lease for 35 years. So really there's no place to site solar in Massachusetts right now. And so that's a huge policy problem that they have. Yeah. So what are the markets? What, where are, is Lightstar active? Maryland. We love Maryland. Maryland's doing a lot of great work with agrivoltaics. I think that this, it has the potential to be the true Petri dish for how to scale agrivoltaics. We're already seeing developers in the industry really turning their heads seriously. They're here learning and really imp trying to implement good engineering designs. New Jersey is going to be interesting to watch because that's where you're going to see the more creative designs because they have a name your own adder situation there. How does that work? Yeah, we don't know yet. Oh. <laughs> Basically, you'll have a base incentive. We're still discussing how what that base incentive should look like. And then you have to stipulate basically by receipt what the incremental costs of agrivoltaics is on a project. And then the BPU will determine the level. And what is that incremental cost in your mind? It depends. It depends on what kind of project you want. If you want to Google agrivoltaics and get the European style up in the air kind of situation, that's going to cost you 10 to 30% more on your EPC pricing. Yeah. That's the real kicker is that the EPC price is more expensive because of the trenching that is needed to for safety to farm above all of the cables and the wires. And that's an expensive penny, but the more and more the EPCs get comfortable with that and it becomes a more market norm, we're going to see that price go down. The same thing happened with single axis trackers. At first, the EPCs were like, oh no, it's a little higher in the air. We can't do that. But now it's big. I do. I'm a big believer that once we get it fully adopted with the EPCs, we can see prices go down. But that's not, <laughs> that's a different answer to a different question. But 
Yeah. Okay, so Maryland, New Jersey. New York, New Illinois, York. Michigan. We just signed a, we were just awarded and signed a contract, which it still has to go through city council approval in the city of Detroit to do urban agrivoltaics. It's going to be pretty interesting. We're really committed to it because it's fully community engaged, which means that the neighborhood volunteered themselves yeah. to host these arrays. And because Detroit has a significant problem with blight, and they're very focused on renewing a lot of the neighborhoods. And so one of the ways they wanted to do that, because the city also has aggressive clean energy goals, 100% clean energy over the next couple of years, and they wanted to host solar arrays. And we applied and we said, hey, we're also an agrivoltaic developer. We know that Detroit has a really robust urban agricultural community. They even have a director of urban agriculture at the city. So we were like, why not? We're opening more land, more space for urban farmers, keeping food local, securing the agricultural component of that within the city. And also we want, we are so focused on making sure that the community has a project that they can be proud of. There's a current array that, it, that was developed by another developer that really missed the mark. We feel that agrivoltaics is going to bring a really good stable option for the community because it's going to be utilized land. It's going to be actively managed. And they really like that. They don't like to see the weeds. They don't like the pollinators. <laughs> they think it looks too scraggly. They want something nice in their neighborhood. And that's what they deserve. And that's what we want to give them. So where it's going to be 10 megawatts. So we're talking like raised bed gardens or? Yep. We're going to, we're working with American Farmland Trust and the Michigan State um, Extension. We have to talk with our farming partners and the neighborhoods first um, to see what they want to do and what they are expecting. Um, no. So, but yeah, we're going to do soil testing. We know that urban agriculture occurs in and around Detroit all the time. We're gonna see we're gonna see what the soil looks like and we're gonna do what's safe and what's gonna be the most effective for the urban farmers. And so stay tuned on that. No. Didn't know about that. Yeah. You said ten gigawatts? Ten, ten megawatts. Okay, ten megawatts. Yeah. Okay, so. Not gigawatts, no. <laughs> okay. That's cool. Urban urban agrisolar. I like it. Yeah. Um what else should we talk about? I don't know what I don't know. What has inspired you so far about the Solar Farm Summit? Yeah, I just, so we're, the first day is the policy track. So I've been running around talking policy a lot because that's a secret ingredient for, maybe not so secret ingredient for market making, right? Because yeah. we're talking about adoption. What I've been seeing and what will really blow things out of the water are proper policy supports at the federal level. I'm really inspired. We just had a great tactical session where we just got the sticky notes out and we did what's working, what's not at the state and federal level. And we had about 35 people show up and it was really hard to find. So those are the real warriors. Shout out to the people who found that room. And it was super inspiring because everybody was understanding that we really do need to coalesce and come together as an industry to work together as policy. And we have decided to launch with Blue Waves and a few other developers a solar and farming association. So it will be a 501c6 advocacy organization that's going to lobby at the federal and state level for uh, a definition of agrivoltaics in the farm bill and then try to lay the groundwork for an ITC bonus credit because that will actually turn people seriously. So this is analogous to the CCSA but focused on agrivoltaics? Yes. Interesting. Lots of moving and shaking going on and we're really excited to be at the forefront of that and We've been working for the last 18 months at the federal level on the policy issues. And it's very clear from the developer's perspective to the farmer's perspective, we need a definition at the federal level. Just one example is that we have a farmer in New Jersey that wants to farm one of our arrays. And he's a first generation farmer. He has a family and he's just really excited about turnkey access to land. And yes, it has steel in it but it, it provides a really great opportunity to, to have free access to land, protection, frost protection, and utilizing less water. He's bought in on that, and then he comes to us and says, oh, I'm gonna go for a USDA grant for a precision ag agriculture application. And I was like, oh, great, we really support that, but actually we don't really know if USDA 
will allow that for you to be eligible because according to their regulations, solar is an industrial use. Mm-hmm. And, the, and so we, you maybe we could put that in, but like we, he shouldn't bank on that being part of his farm plan. Yeah. And that's not fair to the farmers. And because they're farming, they deserve, deserve the technical assistance and the funding support that all the other farmers get. And so that's really what is driving a lot of this definition at the definition push at the federal level is that, yes, solar developers, it will streamline perhaps permitting and some other issues and really get set a high bar, could possibly set people up for farmland tax assessment if they meet the USDA standard. All those things are great. But if we don't have farmers to farm, <laughs> well, then the industry is not in a good place. So it's a both and. It's good for solar and it's good for farmers. And we've seen some really, it's bipartisan. It's incredible. It really, we joke about it. We're like, it's the singular last bipartisan effort is agrivoltaics because it really does meet people in the middle. So there's lots of exciting stuff. And I'm super inspired that everybody is ready to roll up their sleeves and get to it. So what is your, I have just one more question. What is your prognostication for the future of agrivoltaics. I estimate with information from others here that there's about 10% of utility scale solar in the U.S. might be agrivoltaics today. Yeah. Fast forward 10 years, what is a good outcome? 10% feels low. Just from over the last year, according to the National Renewable Energy Lab Inspire map, it went from um, 5 gigawatts to 10 gigawatts in less than a year's span. And that's the stuff that they know about. Our projects aren't on that map yet. There's, I know of of at least four to five gigawatts of utility scale agrivoltaic arrays that are in development right now. And so there's, it is a tremendous uptake that I have seen over the last year and a half. So that 10%, first of all, I think is low. I think it could be as high as 50%. I think 50 or 60% of the new projects that are coming into the pipeline right now. Because you'll hear a lot from the utility scale folks that, oh, we tried agrivoltaics on on our site and it didn't work. And my question to them was, when did you try to incorporate the agrivoltaics? They were like, oh, four years into the design process. It doesn't work. It needs to start in the beginning. And I said, so how long is your development cycle? They said four to six years. I was like, great, start with a plan now. And you can do that now and you're gonna have a much easier time down the road. So. I think that if we're inspiring utility scale and and community scale right now, we're going to see a tremendous uptake, upwards of 50%. We, our aim at the Solar and Farming Association and Lightstar in particular is that agrivoltaics should be a default form of solar development. There's rooftops, landfills, and then there should be agrivoltaics. And I feel like we're getting there and it's really cool to see. And just this conference alone is a huge testament to that. We were half a ballroom of of exhibitors, and now we're three. That's a huge leap. And people are taking it seriously, from investors to policymakers to industry colleagues. Like, there's a a huge tone shift. It used to be like, ah, it doesn't work. But now they're like, maybe we should try it. It's going to be a big growing decade for us, for sure. I'm thrilled to hear that prognostication. I'm with you. I think 50, 60% is totally achievable. And it just makes sense. Yeah. Good for farmers good for developers and that's what we want we want more win-wins yeah and don't be afraid of hard work <laughs> if you're in solar development you're, that's you're, what i say to people all the time you're a hard worker it's not easy developing the project it's like you're already doing something tough just shift it to something else yes all right thank you so much lucy Thanks, bullock man. seeger with lightstar i'm jim montague check out all of our content at cleanpowerhour.com please give us a rating and a review on apple and spotify tell a friend about the show And reach out to me on LinkedIn. How can our listeners find you, Lucy? You can go to lightstar.com or look us up on LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook. We're all there. So join us. And if you're interested in joining the Solar and Farming Association, it's solarandfarming.org. Awesome. Let's grow agrivoltaics. takes. I'm Tim Montague. (laughs) Hey, listeners. This is Tim. I want to give a shout out to all of you. I do this for you twice a week. Thank you for being here. Thank you for giving us your time. I really appreciate you and what you're all about. 
You are part and parcel of the energy transition, whether you're an energy professional today or an aspiring energy professional. So thank you. I want to let you know that the Clean Power Hour has launched a listener survey, and it would mean so much to me if you would go to cleanpowerhour.com, click on the About Us link right there on the main navigation that takes you to the About page, and you'll see a big graphic, Listener Survey. Just click on that graphic, and it takes just a couple of minutes If you fill out the survey, I will send you a lovely baseball cap with our logo on it. The other thing I want our listeners to know is that this podcast is made possible by corporate sponsors. We have Chin Power Systems, the leading three-phase string inverter manufacturer in North America. So check out CPS America. But we are very actively looking for additional support to make this show work. And you see here our media kit with all the sponsor benefits and statistics about the show. We're dropping two episodes a week. We have now over 320,000 downloads on YouTube. And we're getting about 45,000 downloads per month. So this is a great way to bring your brand to our listeners. And our listeners are decision makers in clean energy. This includes project executives, engineers, finance, project management, and many other professionals who are making decisions about and developing, designing, installing, and making possible clean energy projects. So check out cleanpowerhour.com both our listener survey on the About Us and our media kit and become a sponsor today. Thank you so much. Let's grow solar and storage. The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by CPS America, the maker of North America's number one three-phase string inverter with over six gigawatts shipped in the U.S. The CPS America product lineup includes three-phase string inverters ranging from 25 to 275 kW. Their flagship inverter, the CPS 250-275, is designed to work with solar plants ranging from 2 megawatts to 2 gigawatts. The 250-275 pairs well with CPS America's exceptional data communication, controls, and energy storage solutions. Go to chintpowersystems.com to find out more.